welcome to another episode of by side hippies uh today we have someone so special who needs no introduction uh but i'll still give one uh we have today india's one of the leading uh venture capitalists mr pranav pai uh, uh hi pranav how are you doing hi asim uh, thank you very good to be here uh, all well so far as good as it can be given the times we're in right uh you know uh pranav you know i saw you for the first time uh, you know giving a talk in the i5 summit in 2019 where you had stated uh that india is one of the growing economies it has 33 unicorns uh and it's set to grow and today just last uh, i just checked out it india has 100 unicorns so that's been a significant growth uh i just thought i'll ask you what do you think have been you know these macro factors which have led to such a surge in you know these unicorns being built in india yeah absolutely i think it's been a terrific decade 2011 to 2020 uh, so coincidentally the first uh, investment fund in our group was started in 2011 uh, this is before we started 314 uh, so we were you know you could argue we were there since the start and i can tell you when we started barely anyone in this country um even understood the fact that this country could support many many dozens and dozens of large value creators large tech companies uh, there were many interesting problems to solve of course we have a fantastic talent pool you know um, hundreds of thousands lakhs of fantastic engineers product designers uh, product managers and so on and so forth uh, so the fact that all of this would come together and india could become really a top 3 startup economy at uh, the start of the decade i think barely a handful of people actually believed it and the start of the decade is also when if you remember uh, things like aadhar and so on were just getting steam again so many non believers uh, everyone every day in the news were uh, make, you know mocking aadhar mocking startups uh, the, everything is a bubble if you remember right so i think we've gone from a from a culture of disbelief to a culture of uh, i would say being awestruck in in 10 years or less uh, which has been a fantastic transformation today i'm very happy to say very few people still don't believe the story so that that means many many more people believe it and i think over this decade uh, like you asked we've as a country we've proven out a few things that the whole world was waiting for india to prove uh, i think the first and most important thing is that uh, as as a as a country as a national economy uh, there was always uh, this notion in india that we we are too large we're too heterogeneous we cannot all come together and and you know work together on on same things it's it is too many people there are too many states too many uh, competing priorities but what's happened over this decade is as you see whether it's politics whether it's news cycles whether it's business whether it's in the markets you've seen that there's more and more a confidence coming back uh, to 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 india citizens and more importantly to india's young citizens you know below 35 below 40 and coincidentally that happens to be the demographic that starts companies like startup founders are usually uh, sub 40 sub 45 uh, that's also the demographic that consumes technology first first adopters are usually you know tend to skew young and of course now our culture is uh, very deeply intertwined with global culture so the united states europe many of these uh, countries influence how Our, our young people think right whether it's movies tv shows whatever or more importantly on on apps and and services and products that we consume uh, so there's been a gradual awakening i would say of not just founders not just entrepreneurs but also of consumers of employees all all segments of society there's been a cultural evolution uh, that has made indians realize that yes we can actually do more we we can demand more our lives should be better and in fact if these solutions are not available we should think about building them ourselves right So the first wave of companies were trying to replicate solve problems in other places e-commerce hyper local food delivery uh, payments wallets so more more obvious problems but from the second half of the decade from 2015 2016 you started seeing very india focused solutions right uh, so you can argue a half a dozen companies now that are unicorns are very very typically focused on how indian consumers behave how they spend how they save how they think uh, their very specific dynamics Uh, their social organizations uh, so for example how whatsapp became so viral without any marketing now you can argue many many interesting startups have learned from that and have started uh, building products and services that grow in similar ways so i think that's that's one very important macro trend that goes unnoticed is that cultural evolution of indians demanding more building more realizing that there can be more around them second i would say uh, overall uh, as an economy we've tended to 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 do 
less damage to ourselves this decade. Uh, almost always since 1991, uh, the complaint about India has been when we try to take two steps forward, we're almost always taking three steps back in other ways. Mm -hmm. But this decade happened to be a, a decade where everything from how we built our forex reserves up to how we set up national, uh, you know, foreign policy, which countries we built relationships with. Uh, very importantly, we focus on building you know, long-term relationships with Japan, with the U.S. Uh, and a half a dozen countries. Now there's a quad, if you've seen from, from geopolitics, India is now more and more importantly a balancing factor in Asia. Uh, so this decade also helped India become a more uh, well-placed global power. Right? We're not yet fully there. There's a lot more we need to do. It's going to take another decade for us to fully realize uh, our cloud internationally. But I think this decade is when we started making the right steps. And therefore, India's respect globally, uh, the respect for the Indian passport, while it was always always high, because thankfully we had IT and you know the com companies like Infosys, TCS, and so on have made a very positive impression of Indians globally, right? We export our best people, doctors, software developers, engineers. Uh, there's a reasonably good perception of India globally. This decade also raised the profile of India as a geopolitical entity uh, globally. And that was important because when that happens, then global capital tends to have more confidence in coming in. And this is a decade where especially for startups, global capital has come in in billions of dollars, tens of billions every year, uh, if you're counting. And that's been a very important factor to helping these companies absorb that capital and scale up much faster. So unicorns are created because they raise investment. Let's remember that. And investment coming from global uh, pools of capital is a very important driver of that search. And I say, I would say the third thing, besides all the obvious things, uh, would be that I think fundamentally, uh, the dynamic between how Indian consumers think about saving their money, earning their money, spending their money. Right? Um, I think this decade is when we saw a transformation in that thinking as well. Uh, gone are the days where uh, a standard employee is advised by his parents or his well-wishers that buy gold, put it in FD, you know, save for your children, save for your wife. What happens if you die? You know, your family has to survive. So they were very existential questions about money always, right? Which, which is a panic way of thinking about saving and investing and so on. Today, the conversation is more positive. It is about, okay, what are my goals? Uh, how much do I need to save? How do I earn more? How can I make some passive income? What are the best mutual funds? Which app can I use to uh, cut my fees? So there are now more precise questions being asked about your individual well-being. There's, like I said, an individual awakening. It's not just cultural, it's also individual. And I think that's happening across so, uh, groups, social groups, across age groups. Everyone is asking now, I can make my life better. I should take, I should have more agency. And that is constantly, you know, obviously enabled by new products, new services, new platforms. More people are using digital services to invest, to save, or to think about how to spend their money. And I think that's, again, been a big wave of transformation in terms of how money flows in this country. And that's become really important. So while Aadhaar, UPI, and so on are big success stories, even globally today, every country in the world is, is fascinated by how India has done this in 10 to 15 years. We know as Indians, we've been here it's been a very steady climb year by year, you know, very painful transformation. But step by step, through shocks like demonetization and so on, we have you know, we've pulled together as a country, made it through. And that's, I think, a big testament of how I think we will do next decade. We will do much more. There'll be much more subtle as well as dynamic transformation. And I'm very excited by what's to come. So that's a quick summary. I didn't want to go through the standard points of policy and, and DBT and so on. All that is well known. But I'm just giving you a perspective from... From, you know the, our age group our demographic the way we look at things uh, Pranav actually uh, you know thanks for like stating these uh, really interesting sort of these trends which are happening undercurrents which are happening uh, I remember a couple of years back uh, you know you had stated uh, you stated this fact and I was totally like uh, awestruck that I totally noticed yes it makes a lot of sense you said that uh, a whatsapp of US is still a whatsapp of US uh, sort of a Netflix of UK is still a Netflix of UK but in India, whenever something like a hot star tries to come up and make its own version, it gets acquired. So <laughs> at some point, you know, you try to grow the foreign capital, like just tries and comes through and acquires you. But I see now it's changing, you know, like we've already done and breaking through, like through the IT, you know, Infosys and Wipro who sort of like, you know, carved a niche for themselves. And I'm sure this growth story is just going to continue and we will at some point become the dominating players, uh, you know, in this, uh, in, in the world. Uh, so, uh, Pranav, you know, I'm just going to try now to sort of understand, you know, what makes uh, you one of the leading venture capitalists in India. Uh, so, if you can help me understand, 
uh, you know, I want to understand what has been your journey like. You know, what was your early life like? Uh, how were how were your experience? Uh, how was your experience like in Stanford? Uh, you know, which sort of like uh, changed you as a person? How was your uh, work at US as a product manager, and why did you decide to come back to India? Yeah, thanks, Asim. Uh, so that's a lot of questions. Let me try to go step by step. Uh, first of all, you know, thank you, but I, I, I don't think we are one of the top VCs yet. We've only been in the game for five years now, uh, close to six years now. Uh, so it takes usually takes 10, 15 years to establish yourself as, as a reasonable investor. So, you know, I, I can argue we're halfway there, but thank you so much. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, yeah, so my personal journey, uh, you know, I, I've thought back about um, how things lined up to get us to where we are today. And uh, I can, you know, I can comfortably say that, um, you know, ever since I go, uh, got out of 12th standard, so I was born and raised in Bangalore. And, uh, you know, thankfully I had parents that allowed me to decide for myself uh, what subjects I will take, you know, what I, what I should do with my spare time, what kind of books I should read. Uh, they got me a computer very early, which I would say was instrumental in making me think about, you know, how, how things work and how to build components around me. Um, so it was not a surprise to my parents when I said I would prefer to do engineering. You know, I started learning about engineering when, when I was in uh, fifth, sixth standard. You know, that's when your teachers start talking about what is a doctor, what is an engineer, right. and so on and so forth. Uh, so I can argue that up to 12th, um, I kept uh, my options fairly focused on engineering. So it took computer science, so on and so forth. Standard things that every child goes through. But I think, uh, you know, something changed uh, when I wrote that 12th standard exam uh, because everyone in my class had decided in 10th standard that they will attend the IIT. Uh, and that's when I first, you know, first actually saw uh, just how silly that competition has become, that, that entrance exam craze, right? Uh, that made me very nervous. I, I must argue, uh, and my mother did a, <laughs> a very interesting thing uh, after, and I did very well in my 10th, 94, 95%. Uh, so she said, look, you, you're already a reasonably good student. For her, reasonable is 94, 95. She didn't realize that, you know, that's about the highest you can get. But she said, you're a reasonable student. So uh, you must be under pressure now to take IIT. Let me take you to an IIT coaching center. See how they, see what they do to these kids, right? So she actually walked me into a center. You're not allowed to walk in, right? But she just walked in, you know, like we just pretended we're, we're going to check out a class or whatever. And I saw, and she made me look into the class. There's a teacher in the front, right? Uh, there are 120 students in the room. Maybe the first two rows are paying attention. The rest of them are all either sleeping or head down or talking to each other, whispering. No one gave a damn. Okay. Right? And I realized, you know, this is the state that I have to enter into if I want to compete in these silly exams. So I decided, look, I'm not going to write IIT. I'm not going to write any of these things. Uh, I had a fairly allergic reaction to that. And that kind of pushed me to think about, okay, what are the other places I can go to uh, to really build out a, a specialization in, in an area that I like? So I started thinking very out of the box. Uh, I wasn't thinking about, okay, computer science de department, uh, electrical or electronics department or uh, industrial engineering department. I didn't think in terms of departments. I think I thought in terms of streams, right? right? So what are the skills I need? And I think my my parents played a very important factor in helping me think through that. So long story short, uh, I didn't have to you know bother with the JE. I, I did well in my 12th. I wrote the state uh, uh, exams, so the CETs and so on for Karnataka. Uh, got into one of the uh, better colleges in Karnataka uh, in Bangalore. And I made a conscious decision that I will do undergrad in India. Uh, so undergrad in Bangalore, in fact, I'm not going to leave my home city. Uh, right. I'd rather uh, get a you know semi you know semi uh, uh, fantastic experience. Uh, I can study on my own. You know, it's not like I'm going to be restricted and only have to study what the teacher teaches. I can study a lot of other things, and uh, I will focus on going abroad for my masters. So that was an important decision because. The downside is I didn't get the best experience academically, I, I can argue, right? Because in, in the top 10 universities in the world, it, it is a completely different world entirely. And right? anyone who goes there can tell you that. Uh, but uh, the, the good thing about staying back was I got to be around my parents for my formative years, around my brother. So the relationships I built uh, from 17 to 21, I think uh, are the reason why I was very confident about coming back. The reason why for me coming back to India, doing something you know, in Bangalore, forget not even just India, but in Bangalore, was important. There was a uh, more, uh, I'd say, more emotional rooting for me. My network here is very strong. Uh, that was, that was, I, I would argue, one of the most important decisions I've made in my life. Now, obviously, it came with a compromise, like I said before. But in my mind, that was a valuable compromise. So those, those four years, the undergrad, you know, engineering, B is four years. Uh, I had to spend a lot of time basically making sure I had one shot at getting into the top three in the U.S. Uh, MIT, Stanford or uh, Caltech, and I have to try very hard to get into one of them, right? So I wrote, I did everything I could to make sure I prepared. 
uh, thankfully matched the GRE math and so on, did very well in the TOEFL and, you know, uh, eventually got into Stanford. Now, you asked me what, what Stanford does to you. I, I won't take too much time, but it does completely transform uh, what I would call agency, right? How you think about yourself. Uh, you are immediately thrown into uh, an environment where you are on your own. Uh, there is no calendar, no schedule, no, no requirement, no mandatory course. Uh, no one cares. <laughs> All right, you have uh, one advisor in your department who you have to go and report to every so often, right? And you have to make sure you're taking some classes in engineering, right? That's important. You have to have a core breadth and so on. But overall, you're left completely to your own and you're swimming amongst the toughest sharks uh, of your age at that time. Uh, and that's a fantastically open competitive environment. It's so it's not unlike IIT, I would say. There's just more numbers here. So the competition is more intense, but the competition there is also intense, but in a different dimension, meaning it's more open. So you're not competing for the same class every, every day. You're competing to be the best version of whatever you want to be at that point in time, which is a completely different level of competition in time. So that pushed me to take you know, courses in everything from statistical mechanics to uh, you know, uh, cosmological physics to uh, absurd things like uh, you know, biological uh, you know, uh, drug discovery and, and all kind of weird things, thankfully, because that flexibility allowed me to go very broad. Nice. That's right. And uh, I also stumbled onto business. Right? So I, I was fortunate to be able to take courses in the uh, business school there, the GSB. Uh, it's again, one of the top MBA programs in the world. And they're, they're uh, you know, interestingly, they're flexible enough to allow masters in engineering students to take certain courses and list them as credits that you can count towards your masters. So uh, it's a very well-rounded uh, system. I think, uh, you know, every Indian I know enjoys that system, the flexibility, the, the challenge. Uh, I don't know a single Indian student who's gone to a university like that and struggled because they really enjoyed it. They've been able to express themselves. So I think you know, for me to be a dream one day to have that in India, uh, I'm hoping with the new regulations, we can have more and more of that. But uh, that, that is where I, I would say I went through my sharpest transformation. Uh, so after that, it was not a surprise. Uh, you know, I was on campus when Peter Thiel taught that course, uh, startup, startup, engineer, startup, uh, the startup course that became the book, Zero to One. Uh, so that was a, obviously a very in interesting time to be around uh, Stanford. Facebook was just going uh, IPO. Uh, Instagram had become a unicorn, then got bought. WhatsApp had become this big deal. Um, you can argue, uh, you know, uh, Snapchat had just started out. In fact, I, I said no to a job at Snapchat in the first year. Uh, it became a big company after that in 10 years. So no, there was literally the transformation that we saw today, right? We look back and say all these fantastic companies over 10 years were literally being built and becoming a billion dollar companies in front of our eyes. So that was a fantastic time to be in, in Stanford in the Valley. Uh, so no surprise, I, I decided, you know, got a few jobs in big companies, but decided I will prioritize a job in a startup, whatever job I can get. Uh, turned out that I got an interesting job as a product manager, which is a combination of being able to design, uh, you know, workflows and, and, and the entire shape of the product end to end, but also understand more importantly, what the client wants, how, how to do need finding and so on, and bridge the gap between the client's need and what you're building, right? which is the most important thing and making sure the roadmap is, is preserved in a certain way. So that, that able, the ability to stream many different priorities, many different inputs and build one cadence for an entire team, uh, that is, I would argue, one of the most important skills I've learned. And that didn't come from uh, engineering, that didn't come from uh, a, a campus, it came from actual work experience. So that those seven, eight years that I spent, the combination of what I did in my time there, I think shaped a lot about how I thought about what is possible, how do things, how do things get built, how is value created, and therefore, where are the gaps? What can I be good at? Now, coincidentally, those seven years were also, like we discussed before, very transformational for India. Right? 2011, 2012 is when you started seeing Flipkart, New Sigma, uh, you know, Snap, uh, Snapdeal. The first few companies that started becoming big in India. I still remember, and I had gotten to Stanford already, but I still went and wrote the, the placement exams uh, in, in Bangalore. Right? Everyone writes a placement exam, Infosys, TCS, uh, the MCQ. So all of us just went and, went and wrote every exam we could. Uh, for the first time, all of us saw a new company uh, called Flipkart. Right? And then we went to the lab, computer lab, we Googled, what is this Flipkart thing? And then we realized, oh, there's an e-commerce company, ex-Amazon people, they're starting something. Okay, let's go write this exam also. And they were hiring two people, right? and only computer science. So electronics guys were not, not allowed. So, you know, I can argue that was also the time when India was just about starting this, this big drive towards building large companies. And that culture shift I mentioned before, where startups were becoming part of the mainstream. That was literally happening in front of our eyes in Bangalore as well, right? So both places for me, I was seeing things change. And, uh, you know, when, when after I spent a few 
uh, like seven, six or seven years there, realized that, okay, you know, I, I know enough now, I'd like to go back. And if possible, start something with my brother. So, you know, we had made a, a decision long back when we were teenagers, that if possible, we would work together, right? And what, whatever ended up happening, let's try to work together. He had coincidentally picked uh, chartered accounting. So he did commerce and then CA. Um, and he wrote NLS and he wrote the legal exams. He got in, but he decided not to do legal after that. Uh, so he was finishing his CA. I said, okay, uh, you know, he's going to finish as well. Time to get back and let's start thinking about what we can do. And uh, that led to, of course, a lot of uh, interesting conversations and the birth of 314. Wow. What a journey it's been. Uh, also, have something uh, Pranav I've noticed right now. Uh, you know, I always, I, always, I always hear, you know, one of the biggest and the most successful people are usually the most uh, sort of like humblest people you would actually going to come across. And I can totally see that in you, you know, after having achieved so much, you still sort of like, you know, have that grounds your roots, you value your relationships more than anything else. And you've come back, you know, be closer to your parents. That's just a very, uh, this is a very nice thing to like, you know, see it's, ha- it's happening. Thank you.